It's important that we realize that this man thought his life had been a success. More technically speaking, uh, this man was absolutely ready to die, even though it really wasn't his time to die. His name was Gesmus, and sure, uh, he was being crucified, which meant that he'd been arrested, and that meant that he'd committed crimes, and that meant that he'd done things that uh, the Roman Empire had determined were worthy of the death penalty. But in Gesmus' mind, he had lived righteously. He had lived a life that was holy. He had lived a life that was sacred. That's because he was committed to a cause. Like all Jewish people, he believed that God was going to usher in a new glorious age. A glorious age in which Israel was at the center and which all of the Jewish people were redeemed and restored. And they followed this king uh, that they would call the Messiah. And so Jewish people, they believe this, uh, all of them essentially, and they believe that their life and their actions, what they do, what they don't do, could really help usher in this age. Well, for Gesmus, he was part of this group of Jews that believed that they were going to do that through violence. They believed that God ordained their violence, that God wanted them to live a life that was violent. More specifically, that God wanted them to live a life that was violent towards God's enemies. Really violent towards those people who, those people who had um, hurt God's people. So Gesmus, he believed, living in the world that he lived in, that God wanted him to kill Romans. God wanted him to take out the tyrannical empire that had, uh, at this point in history, for mm, 70, 75 years or so, had been, bad math, 90, 95 years or so, uh, had really hurt the people of Israel. The problem is this. If you believe that God wants you to overthrow the Roman government, that's a tall order. That's a, that's a hard thing to ask. The Roman Empire did not become the Roman Empire because they were bad at fighting. They did not become the Roman Empire because they did not have an army that was powerful. The, Rome was, I mean, they were big and they were powerful. And so Gesmus and a whole group of other people, we uh, generally might call them zealots. Gesmus and the other zealots, they believed that the best way to get rid of Romans, the best way to kill Romans, were through what I, I don't know what else to call other than acts of terror, acts of uh, assassination and, and robbing. And really, they, they sort of operated in the darkness. They operated in the shadows. They were the sort of people who didn't think it was out of line to stab someone in the back or slit somebody's throat. These people uh, were the type of people that really made every Roman, not just Roman soldiers, but Roman uh, men and women and maybe even children, sort of lose sleep at night because these Jewish violent uh, terrorist insurrectionist, these guys, they were just, they were sort of awful from a Roman perspective and really kind of from the perspective of just you know, don't kill people, don't murder people. They were kind of terrible. But it's important we realize that Gesmus, as he was crucified, as he was nailed to the cross, that he believed that his life had been righteous. He believed that his life had been exactly what God wanted. He believed he was ushering in a new era, a new age. He believed that God was very happy with him. He had fought the good fight so to speak. But before he was crucified, a really strange thing happened. You see, Gesmus was part of a, a small band. Uh, there was Barabbas, and there was Dismas, and there was Gesmus. this small uh, band of three terrorists, three zealots, three insurrectionists. And they had actually attacked and murdered, uh, robbed, and, and done what they had done in Jerusalem. And, of course, that's sort of the big leagues. That's, that's going after the big fish, right? And so they got caught. And so as they awaited their own day of execution, a thing happened that none of them expected, that no one understood, that, you know, as until they died, I'm not sure that they really understood the significance of this. 
There was this group of religious leaders of Israel that disagreed with the way the zealots did things, disagreed with how this new era, this new time was going to show up. Uh, these religious leaders uh, didn't really like the zealots, but they had somebody else they wanted to die. His name was Jesus uh, from Nazareth. This Jesus of Nazareth fella was a rabbi, was a teacher, um, and he was so opposite of everything that Gesmas was. So opposite. Jesus had taught peace and compassion and love. Uh, he'd even taught yourself to love your enemy, which was absurd to a guy like Gesmas. He never picked up a sword. People called him the Messiah because, well, the way that he taught and supposedly he was doing these miracles, but he never wanted power. In fact, Jesus resisted power. Jesus didn't want people to believe that he was some sort of king on a throne and all of that. And so these religious leaders who said that he was guilty of blasphemy had brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the governor uh, at the time. And they said, we want to swap. We want a, a prisoner swap, essentially. We want Jesus to be executed. We want him to be killed. And we want Barabbas, the leader of, of this small band of people who were caught in Jerusalem. We want Jesus crucified and we want Barabbas free. And I'm not sure they understood exactly what was happening or why or what was going on, but that's what happened. And so as uh, Gesmus was on the cross, dying a death that he was proud of, believing he had lived a holy life, believing he was dying for a purpose, as he hung on that cross, he hung there next to his friend and, and, and fellow terrorist, zealot, uh, Dismas. And this Jesus guy that he had absolutely no respect for, absolutely no love for, a, a man he disagreed with, on a very fundamental level. And now that I've said all of that, that reminds me of something that we should talk about. That there was this one time where God gave me a panic attack. More technically speaking, what I thought about God gave me a panic attack. And, and I should say, I, I don't want to get too personal here in this conversation, but I'm a person who understands the difference between, like, a, a medical, a clinical panic attack and just, you know, feeling a little anxious, uh, feeling a little nervous. You know, this was, this was not just a little anxious and a little nervous. That's, that's not what this was. This was a full-on panic attack, the kind of panic attack where, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just sweaty just all over and uncontrollably, and, and your heart is racing and it kind of hurts, like your chest hurts. You feel like you're kind of having a pan, like a heart attack. Like it's not a panic attack, but it's a heart attack. You kind of feel like that, and 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 you can't you can't stop. And then you know your whole body is shaking, and and then for whatever reason you're crying, right? And you're just scared of everything. And there's just this this overwhelming sense of doom. I don't know if anybody's ever had a panic attack, but but you know for me when I have when I have panic attacks, I it was just this overwhelming sense of doom and gloom and and darkness and death and this feeling like it's never going to be okay. That's what happened, <laughs> and it happened because of God. It happened because of what I believed. About God. I was 12 years old, and, and I'd really been, you know, I'd been raised in a Christian home, and I'd thought about my decision about Christianity and what I thought of Christianity and what I thought about God and Jesus for, you know, a long time. And, uh, you know, I, you know, even going back to when I was like, you know, five, six years old, I remember it being a really important thing to me, and uh, some stuff had happened in my life. And I, you know, at 12 years old, I just decided, look, I'm ready. You know, I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to be baptized into Christ. This is going to be who I am. I'm going to be a Christian, and that's just going to be the way it's going to be. And so I remember telling my parents, hey, I want to get baptized, and I want, to, I want this to be part of things. And I spoke to them, you know, for a couple of months, really, about it. And then we talked to one of the ministers at, at the church that we were attending at the time. And I remember uh, you, we sat down and we talked, and, and it was, um, you know, just kind of uh, formality, really, you know, talking to somebody and making sure that, you know, they understood everything. And that's, that was me. And uh, so we sat down and we talked, and I was going to get baptized on a Sunday, right? So I, my parents, I remember, I think it was, you know, I think we'd gone to like this Christian bookstore back when Christian bookstores were a thing. And we went to this Christian bookstore and my parents, you know, were like, you can pick out, you know, any Bible you want. Um, just, we want, you know, we want this to be a special thing for you to have. And, and, you know, you can, you can keep it and it can be something that, you know, you can read and it can be yours. And it, it reminds you of this. 
And so I remember going around and I picked out this Bible and I, I went home and it was, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm not totally sure uh, what day of the week it was, but it was kind of middle of the week. And I, all I wanted to do was just read that Bible. You know, I was sort of a, <laughs> a foreshadowing of what my life would become later. But all I wanted to do was sit down and, and, and read that Bible. And I remember reading, like, you know, Old Testament stories. I, was, I, I thought it was amazing. Like, you know, I'd always been told these stories of, uh, you know, creation and David and Goliath and Jonah and, you know, the Exodus and all this stuff. And now I could just sit down and just read it, you know. Like, I'd been told these stories, but now I can read it. And I, and I did that. And I remember reading that. And I remember looking, you know, uh, throughout this week, I remember looking at the New Testament and, man, the stories of Jesus were just amazing. I, I, I remember looking at the Gospels and I was fascinated that, like, there was four of them. Because <laughs> I think when I, was a, when I was younger, I just thought, well, you know, there's just one story of Jesus. But it was four and there's, they're all different perspectives and they have different, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they word it differently. And, and there's just just different. And so I remember reading the Gospels and stuff. And I remember being particularly enamored by Paul because... You know, Paul wrote, wrote these, these, these books, and he wrote some big ones, and I remember not touching those. Like, didn't want to touch those, but there were these little books that it made me feel so good that I could read, like, three or four books in a night because they were so short. And, and so now, oh, I, I, I could say I read all these Bible books. And it's funny because, like, there is in no way, shape, or form um, a chance that I was internalizing anything. I mean, I didn't understand what I was reading. Um, but I was sort of getting a, a nice surface level, kind of, you know, familiarizing myself with, with certain books of the Bible. And then Friday came. It was two days before I was baptized. And uh, I remember I was home alone for some reason. I, I, this part of the story is odd because I wasn't home alone very often when I was 12. But I was home alone for some reason. And I was thinking, okay, what should I do with my Friday night as a 12-year-old when I'm all by myself? And I thought, okay, I'm going to read the Bible again. And that's what I did, and I thought, okay, well, I've read a lot of the Bible. Like, I've read Old Testament stuff, and I've read, um, you know, the gospel stuff, and I've read some Paul stuff. So I should read, uh, you know, I'm ready for the big leagues. I should read the book I hear so much about, about it being hard and difficult. I should read the book of Revelation. So I did. I'm 12 years old. It's two days before my baptism. Uh, I've got this new Bible, and I sit down, and I open it up to Revelation chapter 1, and I just start reading. And I read that entire book in that one sitting, essentially. I read the whole book that, that night. And I remember uh, it taking me a while, and I remember being very tired as I got to the end of it. And I remember not really understanding much, but I do remember that the, the pictures uh, were really kind of branded into my skull. Like, they were really... As the pictures, like the, the, the metaphors and the, some of the things that were happening, you know, like the beasts and the, 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 the lake of fire particularly was there. And, you know, this you know, these battle and this war and uh, you know, even in the early stuff, you know, I, I remember very specifically, uh, you know, this thing about, you know, if you're lukewarm, God, you know, spits you out of his mouth and stuff. And I just, this, this stuff was just, it was, it was all really too much. And, and if I can be totally blunt, I, you know, I should have been reading it. And I had no frame of reference for what any of it meant. I had no ability to know what a, you know, I'm not sure at 12 that I totally understood what a metaphor even was. Like I knew like I would have learned what a metaphor was in school. But being able to read something and apply that metaphorically I think was maybe not something I was really good at um, or equipped to do at 12. And the whole thing was just overwhelming. And then I just fell asleep. And I remember waking up and middle night having had a nightmare and in my nightmare I had uh I, it really all these pictures of revelation were going through my head and in my nightmare the bad guy was God you know like God was doing all these things and it was terrifying I woke up in this cold sweat and like my my my, uh, my heart was was pounding and racing and I couldn't get control and I was shaking and I started crying and just this doom and this gloom, this, this horrible panic attack. And the whole time, this horrible panic attack, I was thinking about Revelation, what I had read. And it's ironic. It's funny. You know, I grew up. I've been told, like, you know, you know you'll, you'll mess up your brain if you, you know, watch TV. <laughs> you know, my parents, like, for whatever reason, we had HBO in my house. Or so, you know, if you have HBO on the television, it's all this stuff you're not supposed to watch. And I remember my parents would tell me, like, don't watch HBO because HBO, you know, it's, it'll, it'll scare you and you won't, it won't be good. And I remember watching The Shining when I was, like, five or six. And they were right. Oh, my goodness, were they right? Don't watch The Shining when you're five or six. Um, and it scared me. And so, but it was, you know, I was told TV would scare me. Then I was told video games would scare me. 
right? Like I was told, like, oh, don't play Mortal Kombat. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I remember I'm definitely in that age. I was, you know, eight or ten years old when when the original Mortal Kombat came out, and that was just a huge controversy with, oh, there's blood on the screen. It's gonna, you know, scar kids for life. And it's ironic because I had TV, I had video games, I had Mortal Kombat, and the Book of Revelation was so scarring. Like, I read it all at once, and I remember, you know, the, the, that, that next day, you know, if you have a panic attack, if I have a panic attack, you know, the next day is always a little weird, and so the whole next day was a little weird, and, and then, you know, I went to bed, and I woke up, you know, and I went and got baptized, and it's like I, I entered the waters of baptism. I entered the beginning of my faith, um, and I don't, obviously not consciously, but subconsciously for sure, I entered my faith with this fear, this fear of God. And it was totally based on misunderstanding, completely. It was completely based on, you know, an idiot 12-year-old having no idea how to read the Bible. But it was there. And, and that fear and that anxiety for years was like a weight around my neck. It was heavy. It was this... You know, okay, you know, the Bible tells me that God is only ever good and God is only, you know, God is love, right? The Bible says God is love, but it's, it's for me, I always heard but, you know, God is love, but. Uh, you know, God is good, but. God's, uh, you know, kindness is everlasting, but. And I, I always had that because I always had that fear of, man, I, I had, you know, that anxiety where God isn't always the good guy. And that was part of my faith and that was part of my life for so long. Which makes me think that it's really important, not just for me, but I think probably for a lot of us, to take a second look at God. Which, more technically speaking, uh, would mean for us to take a second look at the cross. You see, Paul, that guy who wrote those little books and big books and one of the most influential and important theologians in all of Christian history and an inspired writer who writes all this stuff, Paul tells us that he wanted to, when he explained God to someone, the gospel to someone, he uh, only wanted to preach to know uh, Christ and Christ crucified. For Paul, the cross is, is the absolute most important defining quality characteristic uh, idea, moment. The cross is the most important moment uh, for us to understand who God is. And on the cross, we see a couple of things that I think it's really important that we understand tonight. One of those things is something that he does do. And one of those things, I mean, he doesn't do. We should start with what Jesus doesn't do. So what Jesus does not do on the cross is fight back. What Jesus does not do on the cross is seek revenge. What Jesus does not do on the cross is uh, lash out at his enemies and kill them all. And I, it should be noted, he could have done that. Jesus on the cross, at the cross, he just could have, you know, <laughs> with a word, killed everybody. Remember, the Bible tells us that Jesus is God himself. He is God as a person, which means Jesus is, in fact, the creator of all things. The people who crucified Jesus were created by Jesus, which is a whole level of uh, interesting to think about. But the people who crucified Jesus were created by Jesus. Everyone who is here, it's sort of like, you, you know, your parents will say, well, I brought you into this world, I could take you out. Jesus could say that about everyone. There is not a human being who has ever lived that Jesus did not create. Jesus gave us life. Jesus gave us breath. Jesus gave us a soul and a spirit. God, uh, Jesus showed us all of these things. He gave us all of these things. Jesus could have fought back. Jesus could have just taken himself off the cross, turned it into an action movie, and that would have been that. And in fact, Gesmus, who was crucified next to Jesus, Gesmus, who didn't have any respect for Jesus, because Gesmus believed his life of violence, uh, his life of assassination, of terrorism, that his life was righteous and holy and, and just, he thought that that's exactly what Jesus should do. This is what we read in the gospel according to Luke chapter 23. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him, this being Gesmus, scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. 
That's what he says to Jesus. That's, the, that's, his, his, that's, that's what he wants to be known for as he's dying on the cross. Gespis, uh, by the way, this, I said it, he suggested it. That was not a suggestion by Gespis. He scoffed. Gespis is mocking Jesus. He's disrespecting him. He's making fun of him. Not only is Jesus, if we can understand this, not only is Jesus on this cross at the hands of people that he made, not only, we haven't even talked about this yet, that Jesus is totally innocent of all charges against him. Jesus uh, he is, has never done anything wrong at all. He has never sinned, much less sinned enough to get a capital crime. Jesus, who is completely innocent, is hanging on a cross. Not only is all that stuff happening, but one of the guys he's dying with has the audacity, the sheer gall, to make fun of him. And yet Jesus does not fight back. Jesus does not lash out. So that's what Jesus doesn't do. What Jesus does do, we read a little bit later in, in Luke. This is what we read again. It says, when they came to a place called the skull, they, uh, they nailed, this is actually earlier in the text, sorry. Uh, when they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals, uh, Dismas and Gesimus, were also crucified. One on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. If we can set this scene, Jesus is dying on the cross. He's nailed to the cross. He's, he's lay, hanging there. Criminal, you got Dismas, you got Gesimus, you got these guys uh, next to him. The soldiers who, who did this, who are guarding him, who, who physically you know, drove the nails into his, uh, his wrists and his, his feet and all of that, they are gambling for its clothes. They're making a buck off of Jesus. So not only do we have a guy mocking him, making fun of him in his ear over here, but now we've got guys who are exploiting him for a buck, stealing his clothing, gambling. <laughs> and while all of this is going on, all of this injustice, all of this just sheer and utter insanity is going on. Jesus is spending his last moments praying, asking God not to smite these people, <laughs> not to you know, get vengeance, not to send them to hell. He's praying to God that God would forgive them. And I think we just need to let that sink in for a second. You see, if I understand who God is, most clearly through the cross, and I understand that on the cross, God, I mean, defiantly refuses to get back at anyone. Def I, mean, God is, I mean, God is stubbornly refusing not to punish these people. And Jesus is faithfully praying for their forgiveness, for their salvation, for their soul. If I understand that that is the cross and that the cross is what we see God in, then there's no need for a panic attack. Because when push comes to shove, when God was pushed to the brink, when Christ was pushed to his limits, he showed nothing but goodness, kindness, grace, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, love. That's who God is. All the bad actors here, all the people who think they're right, all the people who think God wants them to do terrible things, all of those people, God defiantly refuses to punish. And Jesus is praying for their salvation. You 
You see, there is good news for guestness. And obviously the Bible doesn't tell us, uh, or maybe not obviously, but the Bible doesn't really tell us what happens from here. But I, it's very hard to, to think that Jesus could ask God to forgive somebody and God would say no. Which just leads to the conclusion that if Jesus is asking for the soldiers and guestmas to be forgiven, that there was forgiveness for them. And that's so hard to understand. To see that defiant love. God is defiant in his love. As we beg him not to love us. Humanity begs God to abandon us. God won't. Here's how Jesus' best friend wrote this whole conversation. This is what he writes about the cross. It says, Jesus never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Tonight as we reflect on Good Friday, we reflect on the cross, we reflect on what this all means. I always thought it was ironic that we call Jesus dying Good Friday, but when we see the cross, we can see how good it is. By Christ's wounds, we are healed because Christ trusted himself to God, did not re retaliate, he did not threaten he simply did what was right, and in doing so gave us an example to also do what's right. Gave us an ability to always do what's right. You know, when I was younger, I had that panic attack, and it really affected me. Or <laughs> the underlying cause of the panic attack really affected me, this idea that we should be afraid of God. But that's why I love the story of Gesmus. I, mean, I love the story of Dismas, too, by the way. Thief on the cross, uh, that's Dismas. Like, we love that guy because he actually does repent. But Gesmas doesn't repent, and yet Jesus is praying for that guy. You know, if there is hope, you know, if there is hope for uh, a guy mocking Jesus on the cross in the form of Jesus praying for his forgiveness, then, you know, there's hope for all of us. I don't think I'm alone in, in, you know, this idea of looking at God as if God is the bad guy, and if God is the one we should be afraid of. I don't think I'm alone in that. And if that is us, it is my prayer tonight that we can have peace, the peace that comes from knowing that God is, in fact, love, that God is, in fact, good, that Friday is, in fact, good, because God is, in fact, good. That by his wounds, we find healing emotionally and spiritually. We find healing, not through our own efforts, but in the goodness of Christ. Gesmus thought that he was right. I thought I was right. Humanity, we constantly think that we are right. And at the cross, we learn that when we are wrong, there is nothing but compassion and love waiting for us from our creator and our God. It's my prayer tonight that we can have that peace. And as we reflect tonight on this, we go into a weekend in which Easter uh, is there on Sunday, that we can reflect on this goodness that even when we are wrong, even when we are afraid, even when we have anxiety, the God who made us and loves us is always there. And he is defiantly, <laughs> stubbornly good. We'll see you guys on Sunday.